Properly cleaning and maintaining your AR-15 rifle is really important, especially considering that they're direct impingement gas systems, which can cause a lot of fouling and a lot of debris in the action. And it also allows you for more reliability and it gives you better accuracy. And so recently at Hyatt Guns, Roger Eskew, who is over the tactical uh, section there at Hyatt uh, in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is one of the largest gun shops in the country, um, did a seminar on cleaning the AR-15 rifle. And it was one of the highlights of the trip for me because I really learned so much. Uh, there were a lot of tricks and tips and certain aspects that I found very interesting. And so I think you're gonna find it interesting as well. Uh, it is a fairly long video but it's very detailed and it gets into a lot of different things. So I really encourage you to watch the video through to the end uh, because I think you're going to find a lot of things that you're going to be able to use to keep your AR-15 rifle maintained and cleaned. Uh, in case you ever need it, it's great to have it ready to go. I'm here with Roger Askew and he's manager of the tactical side with all the rifles and a lot of the accessories and he taught a really great class which we're going to show about cleaning your AR and I'll just be honest with you I learned quite a bit. Well thanks. I, Don I, I appreciate that having you say you learn something but uh, I really enjoy teaching little tidbits, little hints, things that will make maintaining your rifle a lot easier. Uh, if you don't clean a good AR-15, you end up with a thousand dollar piece of junk. And so if we can get you in where you get some good habits and clean it when it needs it, then that's one of the best things. I want to make customers that are return customers, not because they're unsatisfied with their gun, but because they're wanting to buy another one or look at something else. We want them to be happy with what they get. So we will take that extra step and show you how to do what you need to know how to do with that rifle. And that's the kind of stuff that's really important to support your local gun shop, whether you're here in Charlotte, North Carolina, or wherever you are. And you're really getting a lot of experience and people to actually give you some support. Um, Tell me right now what what kind of the, what are the main guns that are being sold right now as far as two of these? Well, the main types in the tactical arena, you've got people that are starting to really want to surge on the Segas and the uh, Kalashnikov type rifles coming out of Russia because there was that that move by the uh, Justice Department to ban the importation AR-15s. You know, head down is starting to be a really really good mover. A perennial favorite is Rock River. Uh, Rock River will never sacrifice quality for quantity. And then in the high-end guns, you're looking at LWRCI and the piston drive. Um, those guns take three hours of maintenance and turn it into about 15 minutes after a thousand rounds. I've seen me do it. The piston drive guns run cleaner, but to be honest with you, direct impingement with head down, that's, that's kind of a place that you might want to go. Now the AR-15 is probably the most modular weapon system that's ever been designed. When Eugene Stoner designed the impingement system, it was the new thing of the day. It was also sold as being virtually maintenance free and being somewhat self-cleaning. Well, to a certain extent, it was more so than, than any other rifle that had ever been, but there's no firearm in the world that's self-cleaning. And don't let anybody tell you that there is, because there's really not. Uh, AR-15s require cleaning just like every other gun. And if you don't clean your rifle completely and don't clean it well, you're going to lower the service life of the rifle. The first step in, in cleaning an AR-15 is clearing it. And clearing it is where you're making sure that it doesn't have any ammunition in it at all. Uh, it's the most important thing in the world because you're not going to get shot with a clear rifle. Okay, so to clear an AR-15, you want to point the muzzle in a safe direction. Make sure there's no magazine in the rifle, lock the bolt to the rear, and then physically look inside and see that the chamber is empty and to see that there's nothing in the magma. All right? Let the bolt go back forward, and then an AR-15 is broken down. It's got two pins, front and rear takedown pin. You should just generally be able to just walk up and pop these. The more pressure that you have or, or the more resistance that you have, just the tighter that your upper and lower is, and also means that 10 years from now, that AR-15 is not going to fall apart just by popping the, the side of the receiver with the heel of your hand. Right? But you're going to separate your upper and your lower. On the lower receiver, 
for the most part at the level you are as a recreational shooter, you're not going to take the trigger system out. But it still has to be clean. So what you're going to do first is just push down the detent and pull out your buffer and buffer tube. If you take hold of the buffer and the buffer spring, rotate and pull, what will happen is when you turn, it opens these links up and then this buffer comes out. On the buffer, the first thing to check is you want to take it like this and shake it and see if there's actually a weight moving on the inside. <coughs> that weight in hydraulic fluid is what causes the recoil to be eaten up because that weight shifts as the buffer goes back and it takes some of that recoil energy with it. You set these to the side. They're very simple to clean. If you want, on a collapsible stock rifle, all you have to do to take the butt stock off is the exact opposite of what you do to put the butt stock in a different position. So instead of pushing in here, I'm going to pull out here and it comes off. That's all that you can take off of there without a hammer, a punch, and a screwdriver. On the upper receiver, turn it with the, the opening facing up, put one thumb here, an index finger on it charging handle lock, pull back, and leave your hand here so the back of your hand keeps that bolt from shooting out. It's not under it's not under any pressure, but if you put too much pressure pulling back, then the nurse is going to carry that bolt with it. As you've noticed, I'm already starting to, to pick up carbon. That's a great thing. I'm going to make a suggestion if you if you smoke or dip, don't smoke or dip while you're cleaning your gun. Same reason you shouldn't smoke or dip on the range because there are a whole lot of carcinogens and heavy metals that are in this gun the human body was never designed to absorb. So that stuff's getting all over your hands. You don't want to go up to your face with it. Take your bolt, set it down, and take your charging handle. Now on the charging handle, if you'll look, you've got these two little dog ears on the side. Right? One thing when I teach the, the standard AR class, people have trouble when they go to put this back in is that they don't realize that these two dog ears correspond to two little spots right inside here. All you have to do is put that in, push, and it'll drop this in place itself. So you can't just push this in and try and force it down. It doesn't work that way. You want to take your hand guards off, pull down on your delta ring. Of course, if you have a free float rail, you don't want to do that unless it's just really getting cruddy under there. You want to make sure that you get a little bit of oil in here, but that's what you use, the small rod with a patch on it. Get a little bit of oil in there so that you don't have rust underneath your handguard. Standard handguards, once you've practiced and done it for a while, they're fairly easy to take off, but if you have problems with your hands, if you're a nail biter and you don't have fingernails to stick up underneath <laughs> it, and some people have carpal tunnel, they're starting to get arthritis. They make a handy tool. This locks into the magazine well, pulls down the delta ring, and you can just take your hand guards off. This is worth having because it doesn't matter how you're feeling today, you break a fingernail, it may be difficult to get that hand guard off. Don put out in, in his seminar about the vice blocks. I really encourage you, if you're going to do a whole lot of maintenance and things like that with your AR-15, get the vice blocks. They're inexpensive, but they will save you toward the uh, uh, receiver out of alignment. And there's not a whole lot of fixing it. This is aluminum. Once it once it gets out of alignment where it's not going to work, your gun's not going to work the way you want to. And you know, heating it back up, twisting it back into position, you know, maybe, but I wouldn't want to bet on, on a thousand dollar rifle. You know investment in a vice block to save a thousand dollar plus rifle or replacing a receiver and then paying somebody like me to put it back together for you. Alright? Now you have your bolt. Now this bolt is going to be the cruddiest thing on that gun because direct impingement actually shoots the hot gas and fouling down the gas tube which is this silver piece right here and then the gas will go directly through the carrier key into the innards of the bolt. Now once you clean your rifle to the point where there is zero carbon on this rifle, 
it's going to shoot sluggish the first few rounds. The reason for that is the carbon is injected into the bolt and it seals all the leaks in your gas system. So in the military, that will tell you, after you clean your rifle real good, for about the first five or six rounds, it may not cycle the way you want it to. Just be aware of that. If you clean all the carbon off of this bolt and you go back to the range, you may have a short stroke. If you do, that means that you have a leak somewhere in the gas system. Chances are you fire five or six rounds, you'll get enough carbon in there to, to fill that. If not, take your bolt apart and check out to make sure your gas rings are properly staggered. I'll show you that in a second. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take out the we're gonna take out the firing pin retaining pin. Notice I didn't say cotter pin. The head of this pin looks like a football. The cotter pin is round on the top, this is not. This pin has been specifically designed to break if you try to spread the legs on it. That's why it's cut on either side, quite narrow. So if you try to spread the legs on it, it'll break. The reason for that is the design of the rifle, you never have to worry about whether this falls out or not. As long as you can get the bolt back together and get it in the rifle, the design of the receiver will prevent this pin from ever coming out. So don't ever spread that. If you do spread it, then what you'll end up doing is not being able to get this back in when you need to. That's a firing pin. It's also not a cleaning tool. Okay? A lot of people will try to clean their bolt carrier using their firing pin. I'll show you how that, that is. How many vets do I have in here? Did, the, did an old sergeant sometime tell you how to take this and put it in the bolt carrier? Okay, and you, generally when you pull a military rifle, you'd have a, a line beveled in that firing pin. That was what they were doing was using it as a cleaning tool. The problem with that is it wears down the front of the firing pin and you end up having to replace the firing pin. So never use that as a cleaning tool. Now, this is your bolt. This is a bolt carrier. <coughs> Together it's called a bolt carrier group. I picked a gun that we took in trade a couple days ago and hasn't had time to go back to gunsmithing and get it clean. So this is a pretty cruddy rifle right now. All right. The next thing that you have is your bolt. Now you can take the extractor off the bolt if you want to. What's that? Use the fire. Yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> and that really won't hurt anything. It don't work. But I, I prefer to use something else. <clears throat> so I use the fire and pin retaining pin. Pull the extractor pin out. And here you have your extractor. The extractor has two rubber pieces in some guns, one rubber piece in others. There's a little boot inside of the spring that helps that spring retain its, its service life. Don't take this out every time you clean your gun. And the reason I say that, if that spring comes out, you can put it back in, but more than likely, you can end up buying a new extractor because that spring will go back in, and I have actually seen them work themselves loose again. Okay. In the, the bolt itself, you want to look up in here. This yellow is brass that comes off of your uh, ammunition casings. And you're going to have some of that brass up under here. What's going to determine when you take this off to clean is, does your rifle, is your rifle experiencing extraction issues? If it's having extraction issues, go ahead and take this off and you want to clean this real well. Right now, this is taken apart. Right? Yes? I was just wondering, we have the same problem if you used to look at the ammunition. Yes, okay. but not because of the steel. And I'm going to digress about 45 seconds to a minute, and I'm going to give you Roger's Gospel on steel cased ammunition. <clears throat> if you care about your rifle, don't shoot it. Okay. And the reason for that, it's lacquer coated, or it's got a polymer coat, so it's new Wolf Poly coat stuff is a polymer coating. But the point is, it's a liquid coating that has hardened on that round. When it goes into the chamber, when the round fires, it heats up. That liquid then heats up and begins to adhere to the inside of your chamber. So when you 
have that round extracted, it leaves part of that lacquer in the chamber. You fire the next round, does a little bit more and a little bit more. By the time you put 15 or 20 rounds through, if you let it chamber and then set it down and cool down, that, that casing will super glue itself inside that chamber. So you fire it, depends on how much of that goo is in it and how hard that thing is stuck. The round will fire, but that steel case, uh, rifle casing can break your extractor. In which case, now it won't clear, you can't clear the gun. You fired the last round, you've broken your extractor, and then there are several AR-15 companies that are out there will void your warranty for shipping. DPMS is the, is the big one. Uh, Remington and Bushmaster as well. Now, if you shoot steel cased ammunition and they can prove it, they'll void your warrant. So, is it worth it? Not really. That's my opinion. Don, you may feel totally different about that. If I never shoot steel in my gun. He's laughing at me because I always shoot steel. AK-47 for a minute to shoot steel cased Right. Absolutely. So, there are two ways that we can clean this bolt. I'm going to recommend when you start to clean, Get yourself a good cleaning kit. You've got a great investment in your rifle. Don't use Grandpa's hand-me-down cleaning kit. Buy something that's made specifically to clean what you own. Now, personally, I use Otis because I don't like multi-sectional rods. My dislike of multi-sectional rods came about eight years ago when guy at the range came up to me and asked me if I would watch his trigger pull because he's not grouping well. So I go down and I lean down and I'm watching his trigger pull. Well what had happened, he was using a multi-sectional rod. He pushed it through and then as he was pulling back, the rod unscrewed. So there was a bore brush and about nine inches of cleaning rod in the barrel of that rifle. I know this because as I was no more than eight inches away from the barrel, it blew up. He pulled the trigger, the round went off, and it was like having a small charge detonate about that far from my face. When I got up, I looked at this barrel that split into three sections, and the first thing I'm looking is at my bleeding. Yep, okay, no blood. I'll get by, it's all good. And then I was like, well, why did this happen? And I looked over, and he had about this much cleaning rod. And I said, hey, Turbo, where's your cleaning rod? And he picked up the little section. I said, where's the rest of it? And when you looked, there was a bore brush, a lead core from a 270 projectile, and half of a cleaning rod hanging out the barrel of the line. So, I am not a lover of multi-sectional rods. I also don't like steel rods because steel rods, if you get your bore brush stuck or you're using a patch that's too big, as you're pushing through, it can bow that rod, and when it bows that rod, it can go up and scratch the rifling and scratch the, the, the bore of your rifle. So I don't use them. Plenty of people do. Knock yourself out, but when you're taking my class, that's what I'm going to tell you. Otis I like because it's the last cleaning kit that you're ever going to buy. Otis cleaning kits come with covered cables and all of their stuff is brass. You break something in an Otis kit, they replace it. No questions asked for life. This takes the place of your cleaning rod. Now, what Don was talking about with boar snakes, I agree 100%. I've got boar snakes that I've had for 18, 19 years. If you're going to go to the range, at a minimum, take your boar snake, take a little bit of break free. That's at a minimum. When you get home and you're going to clean your rifle, you can still use the boar snake, but I opt for the Otis because I'm going to do a little bit more intensive cleaning. Now, before you run a boar snake, the very first thing you want to do is select a good solvent. I use Powder Blast and CLP together. Why? Because they're both from the same company and they've been formulated not to react negatively to each other as you're cleaning. There are several cleaning products out there that will destroy your gun if you don't use them correctly. All right? So what I do if I'm going to use a, a bore snake to clean with, the very first thing 
I locate where the brushes are. Okay, there are two brushes right here. And then right over an area that's going to trap my chemicals because I don't want them running all over the house. Put just a, a squirt right in front of the brushes on both sides. Go behind the brushes and the stitching. And put just a few drops of oil right here. What that does is here I have my solvent just going through, then my bore brushes, and I'm following up that with a CLP, cleaner loop protect preservative. In your upper receiver, if you've got small hands, one thing to check is down in the chamber here. If you come back with this, that's wrong. That just means the gun needs to be clean. Okay. So, before I get it home, I'll run my bore snake five or six times. That's the equivalent of about 10 patches going through. That also gets all the big, the big cruddy stuff out. And there you have it. Now, to clean your chamber. You need to get a chamber rod and a chamber brush. If you buy nothing else specific for your AR-15 to clean it with, this is a must. This cleans the chamber. If the chamber is messed up, that means you may have to invoke your forward assist, which is this piece right here, to get that bolt to go forward and lock up. The thing that's going to get cruddiest after your bolt carrier is going to be your chamber. How do you clean that well? Once again, I use powder blast. You can use gun scrubber, I just think it's pretty harsh. And I prefer the I prefer the powder blast. I'm gonna spray that down in the gun. And once again, I've got my I've got my spray and residue going into a pan. That way you can easily dispose of it. And it doesn't end up on your wife's kitchen table where she uh, now no longer loves you very much because finish on her tables bubbling up because you spray gun scrub take your chamber rod and brush and push down that far just until the steel bristles are making contact with the chamber don't try to shove this all the way into the, into the barrel if you do you can have a really really bad day trying to get it out turn it some people will put a, a bore guide in here that's been cut to keep this from rattling to the side. What I will tell you, this is brass. That brass is softer than the metal on the gun, so you're not going to cause any problem if it, if it does turn. And once I pull this out, another shot of powder blast. Go back in with your finger and see how much is there. If you still got a little bit of, of carbon, then repeat that process again. Bolt carriers. This is where the, the old drill sergeant will tell you, take your firing pin, take it into your bolt carrier just like this, put your hand on top, and then what you do is make circular motions here. And he says that stainless steel firing pin will pull all that carbon out of there. Well, it will, but it dulls the point of your firing pin to the point after using it for several good cleanings, your firing pin may or may not give you the proper strike on your primer. So remember, this is the heart of your firing system. If the firing pin's broken or worn out, the gun's not going to work. So don't use your firing pin as a cleaning tool. That's why Otis, once again, using Otis products, they came out with this. It's called a bone tool, and that's Bolt necessity is what where bone came from. 
This is designed to fit right inside of your bolt carrier and to scrape all the carbon on the inside out. It's also in the front contoured to your bolt so that you don't have to pull your Swiss Army knife out and scrape the carbon off of the bolt. It comes off with the bone tool. The bone tool will also clean the carbon off of the hard to get places of your firing pin by simply dropping this in here and pulling and rotating. So you can clean the hard to clean parts on the firing pin, the bolt carrier, and the bolt using this one tool. Now the reason I have this up here, this is a hydrosonic cleaner. This is a small one. I have one I use at home. And what this does is I can take all these bolt parts, put them in the hydrosonic cleaner, start it, continue this class, and then when I pull this out, all the carbon will be off of it. And I'm going to set this for 480. And this is using a steel of steel cleaning solvent and then just filtered distilled water. When I'm setting up an Otis cleaning rod, the first thing that I want to do is I want to get my eyepiece. And this is something to this is something to, to take with you. of the 750 kit, you can clean every gun that you own. If you use Otis's patches at least once so that you get an example of the size, shape, and where the cuts are made, these patches you use one for about every eight or ten of the others that you would use. Screw in the jag end. the eyepiece in. Then I'm going to take my Otis patch and if you'll notice there are, there are holes that are cut in this patch in different locations. Take the patch, push your eyepiece through, and then fold this in like the blade of a flower and push that through that slot and then pull down. What you have now with your patch, you've got 100% coverage. Go back to the smaller jag end. Router rod. Now, I'm going to solve it. Derek, my barrel. Just a few quick words on solvents. If you have a chrome bore in your AR-15, do not use solvents that have ammonia as a base. If you do, that flaky green stuff that you see coming out with the carbon fouling is ammonia chromate. That is your chrome bore coming out. If you use Sweet 762 Montana Extreme Bush's Bore Shine on a chrome barrel, and you leave it in there for 10 or 15 minutes, you will pull half your chrome lining out with it. So don't use it with an AR-15. That's why I use Powder Blast. Powder Blast is specifically formulated to work with an AR-15 and the chrome bore. You can also use G96 gun scrubber because it smells good. It works really, really well. And this is the, this is the, the oil that Rock River and a couple other manufacturers use. So this is OEM for Rock River. This stuff's fine, but don't leave your gun unattended while you've used it. It's pretty harsh smelling, so you're going to have to go out to the garage or out on the porch to spray it. Either that, or you got to worry about your kid sitting over there passing out from the fumes. But, you spray gun scrubber in, don't get it on your hands, it'll leave the skin off your hands. Pretty harsh, but it's not going to damage the inside of your gun. I say unless you have something that's specifically formulated for an AR-15, then don't leave it sit for more than about 10 minutes in your board.
right? Whether you're using an Otis, a rod, a boar snake, or anything else, always put the rod or pull the patch and brush the direction that the bullet comes out. Don't sit and do a seesaw motion scrubbing back and forth with a cleaning rod. I used to watch OCS candidates do that at Fort Benning because that was how they were taught to do it. They'd put that rifle in the crook of their leg, use one boot to hold the butt stock, and they'd sit with that rod and in and out. What that eventually will cause, that was going to cause a divot in your barrel crown, and when that bullet hits that divot, that's the direction it's going to spin off on. So that's one reason that the military about 10 or 15 years ago started looking at Otis cleaning kits, and now they're general issue. I couldn't pull that through. As cruddy as it was, take a look at this patch now after running a boar snake through it twice. So not very bad at all. I haven't hit it with an actual brush yet. But by using a boar snake, powder blast, and a little bit of brake free, that's all the carbon that I have in this crudded up gun. Now, you're starting to see where you can actually clean a rifle fairly well, fairly inexpensively, and fairly quickly. But you just have to be thorough. What I would normally do now with my receiver, back over my tray, we'll spray the powder blast in here again, and I'm going to let it sit. It won't hurt anything. But while I let that powder blast sit and eat away at that carbon, I direct my attention to my lower receiver. Not insulting anyone in here, but if you've never taken a lower receiver apart, you might want to learn from someone who has, or make sure that you get a good book to show you how to do it. Volume one and volume two, Walt Krulek's books, one of them will tell you everything that you need to know about an AR-15. That's this book right here. The second one will tell you everything that you need to know about building an AR-15. That's this one. Put the two together. There's nothing about an AR that you can't figure out from this. Or if I give you my phone number, you call me any day from Tuesday through Saturday, and I'll answer your questions. Because I'm here Tuesday through Saturdays. Monday, that's my day. If I'm not shooting, I'm teaching somebody how to shoot or I'm writing articles about guns or testing something new. Okay, But when you leave here, get the number to the shop if you have an AR question, I'll be happy to answer it for you. Alright, on the lower receiver, when you actually look down inside, what happens is you're going to get metal filings and you're going to get carbon down in here. Don't be alarmed at metal filings they're supposed to be there. What that is is the material that the casing is made of. When the extractor pawl goes over the case head, it's going to pull off fragments of that casing. Don't worry about it. But you have to get it out. So once again, how am I going to do that? I spray it out with powder blast. If you notice, I sprayed it with the buffer tube pointing up. I don't want all the crud that's in the lower receiver to get back up in my buffer. I don't have to worry so much about cleaning the buffer to, you know, to a, a really spotless stage because there's not that much in it to begin with. To clean the buffer, all I'm going to do is with the brush attached, I'm going to take a rag, go over top of it, go down inside the buffer turn it and come back out until it's clean. If I'm going to spray solvent in it, I spray solvent directly into the buffer tube and let it leak into my pan. All right? Now, this is stopped. also get these where they heat 
and you won't have to wipe too much of, of the solvent solution off because with the heat, it's just going to dissipate anyway. Go ahead and pass that around and take a look at it. <clears throat> now, with this, you're still going to have a little bit of, of metal flaking and fragmentation. Not a big deal. And if you have to, on parts like the bolt, just run it through again. You don't have to change the fluid, you don't have to change the solvent. Just run the part through again. Now when I go to put this back together, this is essential. This is an old barber's brush. Back in, when I learned how to shave, my dad used a, a mug that had some soap in it and one of these. And you can hear dad throughout the house getting ready to shave because you hear the sides of that brush going tick, tick, tick on the, on the sides of the cup. They're really tough to find now because most everybody that does shave gets their shaving cream out of a can. Barber brushes are tough to find. We stock them here. Most good gun shops will stock them because you can take this barber brush and about 10 drops of brake free and you can lube the entire outside of this gun. Real simple. the head down because it's already put back together. At 10 drops of oil to do the exterior of a full-size rifle, how long would a four ounce or eight ounce bottle break for last? Quite a while. As Don was talking about, you, you might want to get a wrench. There are two types of wrenches. There's a large armorer's wrench, and then there's a small buttstock wrench. The difference between the two, the armorer's wrench actually will allow you to go in here and take the barrel off. It will also be cut to come here and take off the flash hider. Okay? A couple words about flash hiders. Make sure if you're going to change the flash hider on your gun that you put it on correctly. If you don't put it on correctly, then any advantage that you would have on this gun from the location of any of the cuts or any of the compensating parts is gone. You don't put it on correctly, you could also get a round strike on it. If you're going to use a suppressor, you have to make sure that, that's, that that flash hider for your suppressor is put on correctly, and some of them have to be tuned. So we want to clarify on that. All right. This is used on the butt stock. And once you turn it, it marries up to slots on the castle nut. If you're going to take your butt stock off, you need to have one of these. If you've taken your butt stock off and replaced the buffer tube, or for some reason you had to take this off to put a, a quick a one point quick release here, make sure you have this. Because once you've broken the, the factory seal or factory staking on this castle nut, it will work itself loose. So if you have this, so I can very simply at the range give it a little bit of a snug up to make sure that that doesn't happen. Travis to the front All right. Bone tool, this thing sells itself the first time that you actually go and clean a rifle. Now I'm going to put this thing back together because a lot of people will say, where do I oil my rifle? How much oil do I use? 
you'd be surprised that I don't use as much oil as you might think, right? A light coat of oil is exactly that, a light coat. It's just enough to, to repel moisture because moisture plus your gun equals corrosion. And that ends up being that your gun no longer functions the way that it should. And that's a bad thing, right? So we're going to put, using just this, we're going to reassemble this rifle and you're going to be able to see just where you do oil. All right? Down in here, I'm going to put a drop of oil inside of my lower where the where the selector switch runs through but put that along the receiver wall because inside of here is where the detent and the spring is so unless you take your rifle apart by taking the butt stock off frequently that's the only way that oil gets into that receiver is you have to put it in when you're putting it into the lower also, everywhere that you have metal-to-metal -metal contact, the disconnector into the trigger, along the pins and springs, but I'm not spraying it down. I'm using a, a precision applicator so that I'm only putting it in just those spots. Go ahead and pull your hammer back. And you want to make sure that you get this little the little opening in the front of the hammer. That little opening is where a piece called the J spring sits, and that J spring is what holds that hammer pin in place. Without that J spring, you start shooting, that hammer pin is going to come loose. And in which case, if that happens, it's been known for you to get a runaway gun. That is a bad thing, even though it would be cool, man. I, I've, got a, I've got a machine gun then. Well, it is, except it's going to do a magazine dump and you can't control it. So, you want to oil that J spring. And then for the rest of it, I put oil on my barber brush. And believe it or not, this thing will reach far enough down in that receiver so that I have oil on the major parts of the gun. I'm going to go oil on the outside here. You can also use a silicon cloth if you'd like. And this actually has really nothing in it that needs to be oiled. So put this back in. Just like that. My buffer spring. coat of oil on the parts that went through the hydrosonic for the simple fact that it pulled every bit of the oil off the metal. So with it pulling all that off the metal, that heavy coat 
at first, all that's going to do is fill the metal pores back the way that they should be. Now, on a bolt, there are three silver rings right here. Those are called gas rings. And what you want to do is make sure that the split in those rings is not lined up. Now, they don't have to be perfectly 33 degrees apart from each other. Whatever. No. Just make sure that those rings are not aligned. Okay? Why would you want to do that? What's that? It seals off the gas. It seals off the gas. So that's the same thing if you have a cracked ring on a piston in a car, you're going to start to burn oil, but you get, you're getting leaks around that ring. It's the same thing here. I push this in, and you want to depress the end with the spring. Push the pin through. You may have to use your carrier as, to tap a little bit. Push. And then you rotate this so that the extractor is facing up. You put your cam pin in. It will only go in one way. Rotate that 90 degrees. Drop in your firing pin. Put your firing pin retaining pin back in. And I'm going to put that in my cloth and I'm going to wipe off the excess oil. The inside of my, of my receiver is dry as a bone. Hmm. And you may have to use something other than your barber brush. That's not a problem either. And we're going to take oil all in the receiver. That side. My bolt carrier. Pull the bolt and carry it apart. Close the dust cover because the dust cover will hold the bolt in place. Now my interior has all been oiled and cleaned. Excess oil off. <clears throat> Take your hand guards. Remount those. Do a functions check. Place your rifle on. Pull the bolt to the rear. Place the rifle on safe. Tip. Pull the trigger. It won't go. Squeeze the trigger, it clicks. Cycle the round again and listen for a second click, which is the sear resetting. Squeeze the trigger. At that point, you're done. Any questions? Well, thank you very much for your attendance. I want to thank Roger for all the work and the hard work that he put in to helping the seminars and uh, just had a great time here today. Thanks, Roger. Thanks a lot, Don. Appreciate it. Be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic. Uh, considering all the nuances and all the things. Pretty messy and dirty. So one of the things that uh, we had recently. Cut that thing off. <laughs>